Hi, I'm Jen Heil. I'm a recent McGill grad, which I'm very proud about. I'm also an Olympic skier, and I'm here on the line with David Stein. Hi, I'm Matthew Darge. Before I played for the Montreal Canadiens, I played for the McGill Redmen. You're watching David Stein, the best sports reporter at McGill University. Hey guys, welcome back to another edition of On the Line with David Stein. Today, our special guest is Jen Heil. Uh, thanks for coming on the line, Jen. My pleasure. You were at McGill for over 10 years, um, studying management and political science. I would love to hear a little bit about your time at McGill and what that experience was like for you. Well, I'm very proud to finally be a McGill alum, not just a student because I was enrolled for a decade. It took me a really long time to, to get my degree trying to balance my uh, ski career. So I've always been drawn towards business. Um, I've always thought I'd be an entrepreneur of, uh, of some sort. And then I just, um, while I was studying, decided I actually made the change to do a minor in poli-sci because I just wanted a broader view of the world. Um, and I really enjoyed it. It was very challenging, all that essay, essay writing, uh, having an opinion and, and supporting it and, um, and making those good arguments. I really enjoyed it. Okay, well, I'm going to stay on the topic of McGill here. And uh, if we could just talk about your time at McGill, you said it like spanned like over 10 years. But yeah. <laughs> I, obviously, you're doing other things at the same time, so <laughs> there's a good reason for that. But what was your time like here? Did you enjoy the school? Like, how was, did you live on res at any point? Yeah. Like, what was your lifestyle like here in Montreal? Oh, of course, I loved uh, my time at McGill. Um, so my first year, I lived in the McGill ghetto, and I lived very much like a first-year student. Mm -hmm. I knew all the hot spots in town. I uh, was also training for the Olympics at the time and studying, so there was a lot going on, but um, I made incredible friends. They're still among my best friends uh, to this day. And um, from there on, I, I took a number of years off in between all the other years I came back um, while I was training for the Olympics. And, um, and so, as time went on, it, it became more challenging because I would forget everything I learned in the previous year. Um, but I love my experience. I had so many great profs, met so many wonderful people, and I'll always have great memories. When you were here, did, did they know like who you were? Uh, did your <laughs> classmates know who you were? Because, not to take anything away from some of these McGill professors, but they have their head pretty you know, deep into their, into their books and their studies. Maybe they didn't know. I mean. <laughs> well, I usually had to introduce myself pretty early on in the semester because I uh, would be missing mm -hmm. classes right. um, for traveling and different events or training. So I usually had to go and introduce myself and, and try and work the schedule so that I could uh, make everything happen. And, and if I missed a test, <laughs> make up for it. So. <laughs> And you won your first gold medal in 2006. Yeah. Congrats on that. Thank you. Is that fair to say? I mean, it's a silly question, but is that your <laughs> highlight of your of your career thus far? I always hate these questions about picking just <laughs> one moment or uh, one highlight because uh, there's so many moments where you know the challenges are so great. Maybe it's not a gold medal, but the performance was was harder and worth more. But obviously, winning an Olympic gold medal is among the top of my career. Um, it's something I dreamt of doing since I was nine years old. So to work towards it, um, to overcome all the challenges, um, and to actually have it happen was out of this world. Okay, apart from performing in the Olympics and training to get there and all yeah. that, what would you say, what was your best Olympic experience that didn't involve actually performing? Well, um, I compete day one. Mm -hmm. And so I've competed day one of every Olympics. So that leaves two weeks of just having fun at the Olympics. So I have a lot of good moments there too. One of my first mo memories of the Olympics outside of competition was actually before the race in Salt Lake City at my first Olympics. So I was 18 years old. I was sitting on the couch in the athletes lounge and I was watching, you know, the CBC and somebody walks in and sits down next to me on the couch and looks at me and says, hey, good morning, how's it going? And I look at him and I'm not even sure I answered because it was Mario Lemieux. <laughs> wow. And I was just chilling with him on the, on the couch in the athlete's lounge. So that was pretty cool. Did you, did you have anything else to say? Did you? I have no, no recollection <laughs> of it. <laughs> I don't know. All I remember is being in shock. Are you allowed to ask for autographs <laughs> at that point or no? No, I taboo? No, I, yeah, that's a little taboo. Okay. <laughs> I figured it's Mario Lemieux. Maybe there's an exception. Yeah, well, I'm sure he's used to it. <laughs> you mentioned a couple times so far that you had a dream since you're nine years old. Mm -hmm. 
um, I guess something happened at nine years old mm -hmm. um, in order for you to have that dream. Yeah. And I'm sure there were moments along the way where you probably said, well, this is probably possible and I'm going to keep working and I'm not going to stop. So if you want to just talk about a couple of those moments and what happened at nine years old that made you uh, so interested in skiing. Well, it was a pretty ordinary day. Um, I was running errands with my mom. She was filling up the car with gas. I ran in and I was looking at the magazines, uh, waiting, waiting for her. And I picked up a Sports Illustrated Olympic preview magazine mm -hmm. and uh, convinced my mom to buy it for me. And I just was mesmerized by the images. And I loved the intensity of, in the eyes of the athletes. I loved, it was like their bodies were carving through space. and. I was just drawn to it and I don't think I understood why. I mean, I always loved sports as a kid. I always felt the most free when I was uh, participating in sport. So, um, but I, I realized that it was that ultimate challenge, which I've always been drawn towards this idea of, and also the ultimate freedom to get to that place, that edge of your ability and try and go further. It's always, um, it's always excited me. So, yeah, I was basically signed up. I wanted to be an Olympian. I had no idea in what sport or how, mm -hmm. um, but I always kept it in my heart. And then I did a million sports, and um, over time I became more serious uh, about skiing. But I, I lived in Edmonton, so <laughs> not really your, you know, your number one uh, place for skiing. So, um, yeah, over time, as I said, I just kind of kept it in my heart. I, I, I never closed my idea, my mind to it, and then eventually things became more serious and I organized my life um, to make it happen. Well, I mean, we'll thank um, Sports Illustrated for your <laughs> Olympic gold medal in 2006. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, okay, I, I'd like to find out what, along the way, I'm sure you were given advice by some people. I mean, I'd love to know what the best advice you were ever given was mm -hmm. and who gave it to you. To face my fears and to embrace the moment. And. Um, when you're standing on top of a hill with 100 million people watching live and uh, the Prime Minister of your country at the bottom of the mountain and uh, all you want to do is win a medal, mm -hmm. it's very hard to, to kind of embrace that moment and face all of those fears. So um, I, I had to work hard mm -hmm. to, to have the capacity to do that. But yeah, to find that joy in the most difficult of mm -hmm. places um, has definitely been the greatest advice and every time I've succeeded and look I look back on it It's always when I had joy mm -hmm. and brought that emotion to, to the moment no matter how challenging it was Charles, what, what would be your best advice? Um, well, I mean the beautiful thing about skiing is that you're outside in some of the most wonderful places in, in the world um, and so I mean it really if it's something you love to do you already understand that um, so just to enjoy that moment and to soak it up for what it is. You know, you, have, you perform every four years, so what's the training like in between? Uh, what's your routine like and how does that change in year one, two, three, four, leading up to the Olympics? Do you have enough time for this answer? Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, every four years is the Olympic Games. Yeah. Every two years is World Championships. Yeah. And every year we have about 12 World mm -hmm. Cup competitions. So for an athlete, of course, we're our most important competition is obviously the Olympics, but we put a lot of value on every competition. So one of the most uh, prestigious awards within the community is the Crystal Globe. So all snow sports win the Crystal Globe, whether it's cross country, alpine. And that's like uh, who wins the F1 uh, tour, so the, the person who has the most points. So um, consistency is very important to win that. And then, you know, even though the Olympics, it's once every four years, you still want to have that consistency to know you can perform on demand. Mm -hmm. So it's all about having the necessary preparation to, to be able to perform at any given moment. So um, mogul skiing is a, a very unique sport yeah. where we have to manage a lot of different forces. So our core is critical. So everything I did in the gym was, I, I rarely did squats in a squat rack. It was always with dumbbells on one leg or with a pulley system and my trainers pulling me off balance. So always trying to manage these different forces. A lot of trampoline uh, trained water ramps. So we practice our flips and our jumps into water. Um, a lot of plyometric based training. So jumping around. I ran the stairs here um, on campus, the bottom of the peel stairs, till I threw up with Alex Bilodeau every Friday for about eight years. And, um, and then I did a lot of training on the bike, uh, so high power, high intensity type training. And then traveled 
in the summer to find snow to train in Switzerland, Australia, Argentina um, to do actual on-train snow, snow camps. So that's what I love about mogul skiing. It's a very, it's varied uh, the training and you never get bored. <laughs> were there any moments along the way where you may have doubted yourself? Uh, were there ever moments I doubted myself? Of course, uh, many moments. Um, my hardest, the hardest time in my career was in the lead up to 2010. Um, my dear friend uh, Sandra Larua from France was paralyzed doing a backflip and uh, for me I had a lot of fear after that moment. Um, I took another year off, came back to McGill full time to, to also do reconditioning simultaneously and uh, when I came back to, to the World Cup circuit I, uh, I was not skiing well. <laughs> so. It was about a year and a half before Vancouver, the biggest competition of my life, and I wasn't skiing well and I had a lot of fear. So um, that was very hard to overcome, and I had to work very hard mentally um, as well as physically to, to get myself into the start gate and, and to be ready. Thanks for doing this. And yeah, my pleasure. I appreciate having you. All right, great All right. to be here on the line. All right, thanks. <laughs>